Hey, good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bibles for me. Turn with me to the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 13 today, and I just want to welcome you back to the seventh week of our series that is just all about what authentic church really looks like according to God's Word. One theme that runs not only throughout the entire Bible, but also the book of Acts is God's passion for missions, starting right here in our own community in Greensburg, spreading out to surrounding communities, to the state of Indiana, to the good old red, white, and blue, and across the globe to every people, to every tribe, to every tongue. But here's the real question. Why? Why does God care so much about the gospel message going out to every single person on the face of the earth? See, it's because the God of the universe loves his creation. And as his word teaches us, he doesn't want any to perish without knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. See, God's desire is to take people just like us who have all kinds of insecurities and fears and flaws, and he wants to redeem us, he wants to transform us, and through the Holy Spirit, he wants to use us to lead people to what true hope really looks like in Christ, to lead people into the arms of Jesus, because Jesus really is enough. Now, you should be here with me in Acts chapter 13. And today we're going to focus just on these first three verses Here in Acts 13, let's go ahead and pick up in verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Okay, so have you ever noticed that in those moments when we come before God without any other agenda than to worship him, to lift him up, to give him praise for how good he really is? Have you ever noticed when we do that, that the Holy Spirit loves to speak into our lives, loves to speak into our hearts in those moments? I've seen in in sad times, I've had this happen in my own life, when someone is struggling, maybe when I'm struggling and I felt kind of lonely, I've seen God just whisper into my heart that he is there. And like Psalm 91 teaches us, he will walk beside us, he will be our refuge, and we can find shelter in the shadow of his wings. I've also seen the Holy Spirit so many times, not just in my life and in other Christians as well, as we worship him to just speak to his children in worship in such a way that we feel like God is calling us to a certain work for his kingdom, that he just lays out a mission that he wants us to do that we can only do through the power of the Holy Spirit. And here in our passage today, we find that this church in Antioch had gathered together like they always did to praise Jesus. And I'll just be honest with you. As a pastor who likes to kind of check up on people when they miss a few weeks of church, and this is kind of pre-COVID, we know that people have missed a lot of weeks because of that, and you can't completely help that. But as a pastor who likes to keep an eye on on people and let you know that we miss you, I've heard a lot of excuses over the years. Now, some are good ones. They're legitimate. Others, not so much. But here's a group of men and women gathered together for worship. And if anybody has a good excuse for why not to show up and worship God together with the body of Christ, it was this group in Antioch. They were dealing with ridicule. They were dealing with persecution because of their faith in Christ. They had to be careful where they met. Some may have even worshipped with one eye open just to make sure that Saul, who we know as Paul, was no longer a terrorist against them, that he was for real about his faith in Christ. And it was during this time of worship that the Holy Spirit spoke into this group. He made it very clear that Saul, who we know as Paul, and Barnabas are to be sent out by the church on a mission to share the gospel with those who've never heard. And there are three things that I want you to see in this passage that were true for Paul and Barnabas, and they're true for you and I today, 
okay? First thing I want you to see, and by the way, you can download that outline. I know I'm a broken record every week, but go to fccgreensburg.com, click on online services on the homepage, click on today's date, and then you'll see the outline. You can print that out at home. You can take notes if you're a big note taker. But the first thing I want you to see today that's true for us and Paul and Barnabas is we are set apart. We are set apart. Apart. We are called to be holy, not because of anything we've done, not because of our dashing good looks or wonderful accomplishments, but because of God's amazing grace and mercy that he's lavished upon us. And so as people who've been redeemed by God's amazing love, we are called to live a life that shows that we aren't driven by the things of this world, that we see things through the lenses of God's word, that we are a light that's shining in the darkness. Now listen to these words that have always meant so much to me when when Satan comes calling and he's telling me, just like he does to you at times, he, he tells us that we're good for nothing, that we'll never measure up, that we can't do anything right, that, that we're worthless, that we don't mean anything to anyone. He loves to speak these lies into our lives. But listen to these words from our God that come from Psalm 139. And I'm going to start here in verse 13. It says, For you, God, created my inmost being. This is David just pouring his heart out before God. For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. What an incredible picture. Just kind of picture that in your mind. I praise you, he says, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes, God, saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, God wants us to know today. He wants you to know. He wants me to know that we were made on purpose for a purpose. He wants you to know like the shirt that I wore as a little boy that said, I'm okay because God doesn't make junk. He wants you to know that he doesn't make junk, that he wants you to know that you are a masterpiece. Like Ephesians chapter two teaches us, he wants you to continue to be molded into that masterpiece more and more every day as we're molded into that image of Christ, as we are that clay in the potter's hand. And when your identity is in Jesus, you don't look and act like the rest of the world. Because as a believer of the Most High God, you and I are set apart to look different than the world around us. To be honest with you guys, I don't get surprised when I turn on the news and I see and I hear philosophies on life that are completely opposed to what God's Word teaches Jesus told us himself that the world would be different than us, that they would see things differently, they would even hate us, and they won't think they won't think the way that we do as believers. But what breaks my heart is that even some churches today are walking away from the truth of God's word. It is so sad. We're, we're watering things down to try to uh, fit in with our culture, to make everyone feel justified in whatever sin, whatever lifestyle that they choose. And guys, I just want you to hear my heart. There is freedom, not when we water things down and walk in the ways of the world, but there is freedom when you choose to walk according to God's blueprint. Doing life his way leads those things that every person is searching for, that peace that passes understanding, that true joy that's not dictated by our circumstances. And here in our passage, we see Saul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, set apart by God for the mission where they will go into the darkness that had never heard the message of Jesus and share that with them. And I think sometimes we stand back and we cheer on guys like Paul and Barnabas, and that's great. But don't forget that we too have been set apart from birth by a perfect God for a work designed just for us. And I absolutely love this quote by Colin Smith. He says, don't ever expect the world to shine for you. God calls you to shine for the world. The world is a dark place. And God has put us where we are to be lights. And then he says, that's the challenge for the whole church. And you know what? Your mission field may be right here where you live. If you live in Decatur County, maybe in Batesville, Shelbyville, Columbus, Rushville, wherever you live, 
that is probably your mission field. Because I think most of us are called to be where we are, okay? And God has called you to be a light. So shine, shine for him. Or maybe he's calling you across the state or across the country or across the world. I got a friend who never thought growing up that she would be in Japan, but she's been there for a while now uh, as a teacher teaching, but also sharing the love of Jesus. But wherever God prompts you, know that you are called and you are set apart for his work. Next, I love the church's example here in that they heard that call to be holy, to be set apart, to be different from the world around them, to look like Jesus, to be his hands and his feet. And then they made sure that these two men were prayed up. They were prayed up. You know, my favorite thing, and I've shared this in other weeks, my favorite thing about uh, the book of Acts is they didn't just talk about prayer being important. Their leaders and their church were committed to making prayer a priority. They prayed, they prayed all the time, and they prayed together. They were committed to seeking God's face and his direction in everything that they did. You know, today in the American church, it's so easy to get caught up in programs and church meetings and planning sessions and all this other stuff. And don't get me wrong, those things can be good. They can be necessary. They're not always, but they can be. But if they are not guided and preceded by seeking God's direction, by asking the Holy Spirit to lead us, then those things are empty. We're not called just to give token prayers at the beginning of meetings. We are called to seek the heart of God with everything we are. And I love this quote written back in 1931 by a Norwegian theologian named Ole Hollisby. He said, prayer should be the means by which I at all times receive all that I need and for this reason be my daily refuge, my daily consolation, my daily joy, and my source of rich and inexhaustible joy in life. You know, church, when we take those words to heart to the point where prayer and God's word really are our daily bread, then we will see God do things in our community in our church, in our world, in our families that will absolutely just blow our minds because great things happen when you and I get out of the way and we let God steer that ship. I don't know about you, but I can be a control freak and God is trying to teach me every day, Ray, you need to get out of the way and let me do what I do. And it's amazing when I actually listen and and follow that, what God can do. There's a story that I love to tell because it's a great picture of what happens when God's people truly pray together. I Once there was a a missionary in Africa who had been there for decades. He loved his people that he had ministered to for a long time. And during that time, there was a lot of political turmoil. There was guerrilla warfare going on. And even though he was advised to leave the country, he said, no way. These are my people. This is my place. I'm staying. So one night, word came by radio that a group of rebels were following them, that they had already encircled their camp, and they were planning in the middle of the night to probably kill everyone. And the missionary was scared for his life. He knew they really couldn't defend themselves, and so all he had at his disposal was the thing he needed most. He prayed. Finally, after praying, he felt a peace from God, and he just went to bed, not knowing what was going to happen in the middle of the night. When he woke up, he was shocked. He kind of felt himself. He was still alive. He wasn't in heaven. And and he walked outside real quick, and there was no one to be seen. Nothing had been disturbed. The enemy was nowhere to be seen. A few years later, he won a man to Christ that was once in a rebel army. And that man told him that he recognized him from the night that they surrounded his camp. But this man said, as they got closer to the camp and were ready to move in, they saw 47 armed soldiers all the way around the camp. And so this small band of 15 or 20 mercenaries, they decided it wasn't worth it and they fled. Well, as the missionary heard this story, he was kind of confused because he didn't have any soldiers with him. They had no protection whatsoever. When he went back to his home church in England, not long after that, he shared that story about how he had prayed that night. And apparently there were soldiers that guarded them through the night. And he prayed, he, he kind of shared that, 
and he shared the date of which it happened. And after the service, a faithful prayer warrior came up to him and said, are you sure that was the date? And he said, yeah, man, I was scared for my life. I know what that date was. And that's when this man told him that very night that he couldn't sleep. The only thing that he could think about was this missionary and his safety. God was just putting him on his heart so strongly. He called as many people in the church as he could, got them to gather at the church, kind of late at night. It was kind of an odd request. And they simply prayed their hearts out for whatever may have been going on with this missionary. And then he looked at him and said, you said there were 47 soldiers around your camp? He said, I stood at the door and I counted everybody who came in. And there were 47 of us who were praying for you that night. Man, I don't know about you, but I got goosebumps right now. Church, we have been set apart to be holy, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we have to be prayed up. And then last thing I want you to see is we must be sent out. We must be sent out. You know, this early church didn't just pray. They didn't just talk a big game. They followed through. They sent Paul and Barnabas out with their blessing, with their love, with their support. And I love this passage in Romans 10 uh, that shows God's heart for missions, whether it's here in our community, whether it's in our state, whether it's across the country, or even in a place like Haiti or Guatemala. Romans chapter 10. Go ahead and look at this. Look at this passage with me here. Romans 10. And I'll start here in verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet that bring the good news. (laughs) Now, I want to take a few moments and just kind of share uh, my heart for missions and even a few great examples of missions that we have in our church that I've experienced in my own life and just share that, that missions is right where we are. It is living our lives for Jesus, but it's also as a church in who we support and who we send. And so we believe in missions. Like I've said, we believe in missions right here in Greensburg, and we uh, support a lot of them. We believe in missions in the state of Indiana, and we support them. We believe in missions throughout our nation. We support missions that way and even in other countries across the globe because Jesus loves every person, every place, every tribe. Okay, let me go ahead and share with you about a missionary that we support right here in Indiana. Her name is Bridget. And Bridget is right here from right here in Greensburg. She is a wonderful follower of Christ, an awesome example of his love. And she actually works for Crew at Ball State. And Crew is, it used to be called Campus Crusades for Christ. Now it's just called Crew. And it is on the college campuses all over the country, all throughout the world. And they are just building up Christ followers bringing people to Christ and just sending them out. Because where do, where do college kids go? They go everywhere, right? They come to this one place and they go back home. They go wherever they feel sent. So it is awesome ministry where the gospel is going out throughout the world. Actually, just go ahead and, and watch Bridget and this video and you'll hear it for yourself. Morning, First Christian Church. I'm coming to you live from my kitchen in Muncie, Indiana. Wish I could be there with you in person, but it is what it is. I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you. Thank you for financially and prayerfully partnering with me to reach college students and faculty all over the world. God has been at work here in East Central Indiana. Whether we've been on campus or not, we are seeing people come to Christ. He's bearing fruit and he is making disciples all over the nations. So to God be the glory. And I thought I would take this morning and just send a little video to show you some glimpses of how God has been at work in our current students through the ministries of Crew and Impact here at Ball State in East Central Indiana, and also some graduates to see how this ministry has changed their lives forever. And so my prayer is that you are encouraged to know that you have been a part of this. So thank you, and to God be the glory. Hi, my name's Sarah Allred, and Crew has shown me how easy it is to share the gospel with a stranger. My name is Carl Torrance. I'm a sophomore at Ball State. I'm in Crew and Impact. 
Um, and they both taught me how to be led and to lead others in my faith. My name is Ryan Walker, and crew gave me the ability to have a relationship with God. It also gave me the confidence and tools to equip me to share my faith with those that are around me. And as a high school teacher, I can now do that with my students in the classroom, through sports, through FCA, and other clubs. My name is Lydia Elliott, and through my involvement in crew, I grew in the foundation of making my faith my own and learned how to share the gospel in a way that I've been able to see lives change. Hi, my name is Alex Morgan, and I came to Christ my freshman year at Ball State Crew. And I'm so thankful that God gave me the opportunities to be a part of His Great Commission. Hello, um, my name is Nathan Wardai, um, and I'd like to say that my involvement with the Impact Movement um, has equipped me with the tools to spread the gospel with the campus and the world. Hello, my name is Katie Kroll. I am a Ball State Crew alum, and through my involvement with Crew, I learned how to take ownership over my walk with the Lord. Hi, my name is Destiny Johnson, and through my involvement here with Impact at Ball State, God has definitely taught me how to disciple others and be discipled um, and learn how to walk this thing that we call life. Also, he has taught me how to be able to steward over the blessings that he has already given me. My name is Stephen Childress, and through my involvement in crew, I was able to be discipled by mature, godly men and able to disciple young men of my own. Hi, my name is Allie Jones, and through crew, I've learned that the creator of the universe not only knows me, but he loves me, and he wants to have a personal relationship with me. You know, I love to hear just these amazing stories of what God is doing uh, throughout our state, throughout our world. It is incredible. And I'm so thankful for Bridget and just her heart to share Jesus and to build these students up for the glory of God. Let me share a little bit about my experience in Haiti. See, back in 2015, when we were ministering in Rush County, uh, we took a group from our church. I think there were around 10 or so of us. And we went to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And we had the opportunity to share Jesus. I got to preach a couple times and we got to do some work to help them out. And we went to this mission that is an awesome mission called Haiti Outreach Ministries. Uh, Leon Orleans is a Haitian, but he also studied in Bible college here in the United States. A godly man, honestly, a lot like the Apostle Paul probably in Haiti, just an incredible man of God. And we got to go and be a part of his ministry and what he was doing. And I remember as we flew into Haiti, I remember just seeing uh, this kind of giant, what looked like a, like a pole barn to me, big metal building. And by the way, that was their, their airport, okay? It's not the same in a third world country as it is here. And so we flew in and as we went through customs, I realized that this place was different than the United States. We got in our tap tap. And if you've ever wondered uh, where all those little uh, Isuzu and, and Toyota uh, little mini trucks that you saw in the 80s and 90s and where, where all the camper shells that were on them, if you ever wondered where they went, I'll tell you, they're in Haiti, okay? They use them kind of as a taxi service. And they put a bench in the bench seat all the way across on each side of the back of, the, of these trucks. They have the camper shells on them. They put a, a pole where you can kind of hold on. And they shove about 20 people in the back of these tiny little trucks. And they use those all over Haiti. But I remember just driving to the, the compound where we were going to be staying. And... I looked out at one point and there was this dry, giant mound of trash and it, it's sad. There's trash everywhere. And there was this, she was at a distance, but I'm pretty sure it was a woman, she, a naked lady that was right there in the trash, just digging for food. My heart broke in that moment. And I began to feel so sorry for these Haitians and the way that they live, the way that they have no, uh, they don't, they don't know any different, but just the way that they have to uh, experience their lives. I remember going into the compound, they opened the gate for us. And, and by the way, to have anything nice that doesn't get destroyed, you have to put these big walls up. You have to put sharp stuff on top so nobody can get over them and you have to put gates or else uh, you just won't have anything. And so they have about three locations where we went and they just, they have a, they have a school, they have a church and they do a lot of outreach in their area. And I remember going and at first I just felt so sorry for these people of Haiti, for everything they experience and go through. And then I got to know these Christians. 
I, I got to be in worship with them and just see their hearts for Christ. I got to be uh, around them and see joy in their lives. We had a translator, so we got to interact with a lot of Haitians, and they had such an incredible joy in their life. And I even got to see all these school children in their, 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 their nice uniforms, and they would be singing praises to God every morning, one of the most beautiful sights that I've ever seen. And I remember when we were getting towards the end of our week, where at the beginning of our week, I kind of just felt sorry for these people and all that they had kind of uh, gone through in their life. Towards the end of the week, I started to feel sorry for us in America because I saw their joy. I saw that Jesus really was enough. I could see how hard it is in our country with all the material things and all the things that are tugging at us and tempting us. I could see how hard it is to truly follow Jesus. And yet here are these people in Haiti with nothing other than probably the clothes, a few pairs of clothes and the things they have. And here they are just with such joy about loving God and loving people into the arms of Christ. And I remember specifically just saying, God, help me, help me to have a heart like theirs. Now I don't feel sorry for them so much. I feel sorry for me because I miss what it's all about sometimes. My focus is so selfish sometimes, and I want to have a heart like them that is all about living for you with everything I am. I'm so thankful I went for Haiti, went to Haiti, and I just encourage you to pray for them. Let me share one more story with you about a lady in our church named Barbara Lee. Barbara is a godly woman, has been in our church for years, and, and Barbara had a hip replacement surgery and a knee replacement at the same time just a couple weeks ago. And as she was getting that done, there were some complications. She was in surgery for longer than they wanted, and with her age, sometimes it's, it, it makes it complicated the longer you're in surgery. So when Barbara came out, she had some complications, and she was in ICU for a little while. She came through it, and she's doing great now, recovering at home, and I'm so thankful for that. But one day when she was in ICU, Barbara had her Bible in her hands, and she was reading God's Word, and she was praying. About that time, a nurse came in named Lily. And Lily and her started talking. Barbara said that they really just had a connection. It was one of those relationships where they just hit it off right away. And they were talking about things. And Barbara had her Bible. And that kind of sparked some conversation about God. And then Barbara felt the Lord lay it on her heart to say, Lily, do you and, and your family have a church that you go to? And Lily said what a lot of us have said at times. You know, we always make time for what's most important. But Lily said, you know, I'm busy I work here every other weekend, and I got so much going on in my life. I just don't have time for church. And so Barbara, if you know Barbara, she's very gracious, very kind, so loving. And so Barbara just kept talking with her, and they were having great conversation. And finally, Barbara felt very strong in her heart to say, Lily, have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ to make him the Lord and Savior of your life? And she started talking to her a little bit about that, and 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 Lily was responding and she said no I haven't and Barbara said well it's you know there's there, there's not a lot to it it's very simple it's all about your heart and surrendering to him and as they talk Lily said well I'd like to give my life to Jesus right now <laughs> and Barbara said she was shocked she did not expect this and and so Lily right there on the spot said she wanted to give her heart to the Lord Barbara explained it to her they prayed together and right there, she was a brand new creation. Lily uh, got baptized. I, I think she got baptized right after that and is following the Lord with all her heart. And I'm so thankful for uh, just someone like Barbara who felt God laying something on her heart and she was faithful to just be a voice for God in that moment, to let the Holy Spirit lead her and so I want you to pray for Lily, just to pray that God grabs a hold of her, uses her life, blesses her family. We would truly appreciate your prayers for Lily. And you know what? Barbara is an example for all of us because you and I go all different places, right? I mean, we go to work probably every day. We, we go to Walmart. We're around our family. We're, we're all different places. And we have been called by Jesus to be a light for him because of his amazing grace that we now walk in. We want to do, like many quotes I've heard before, we want to go to the gates of hell and we want to pull as many people out of there as 
as we possibly can who are who are headed that way we want to tell them about the love and the grace of Jesus that he can forgive anything from your past wipe it out and come into your life and change you it simply takes us confessing him as lord and savior repenting of our sins uh, surrendering those to him making a 180 with our lifestyle confessing Jesus Christ being baptized into him and we will be his child, full of the Holy Spirit, ready to serve him. So if you want to talk about giving your life to Jesus, I want you to know you can call us uh, here at the church. My name's Ray. Call 812-663-8488. Or you can email me at ray at fccgreensburg.com. I'd love to walk you through the scriptures and just see God do incredible things in your life. Thank you so much for watching this message today. We pray God's richest blessings on you. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word today. I thank you for uh, Bridget and her heart and her ministry. And I just pray for crew at Ball State, crew all over the world, that you will bless them and that you will use them to win people to Christ and to send them out to be a light for you. I thank you for what you did in my heart in Haiti and how you changed my mindset in so many ways. I thank you for our team that goes to Guatemala quite often here at the church, and I pray you continue to bless that ministry. Father, I thank you for Barbara Lee and her heart, and, and just pray that we will have that same heart. And I pray over all the missions that we support here at the church that you will just do incredible things in them and through them. Father, thank you for your heart for this world. Thank you that you love us so much that you would send your son to die to take our place and to give us hope on this earth and hope for all eternity. God, you are awesome. We love you and we pray this in your precious and your holy name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.